Uh, today's scripture reading is Hebrews 2, 5 through 18. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For, who, for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Amen. It is so good to see you all. It is so good. Uh, I'm going to go right into this passage because this is going to be... Uh, the last sermon for this year for you. Uh, and uh, it's just going to be a little longer. So I'm going to go right into this passage. I have to warn you a little bit. The first thing you notice from this passage is a quote from the Old Testament. Verses 5 to 8. It's quoting the Old Testament, Psalm 8 actually. And Psalm 8 says, What is man that you are mindful of him, that you made him for a little while lower than the angel? What do you think the author, David, in Psalm 8, or the author of Hebrews here in chapter 2, what do you think uh, they were referring to when they said, What is man that you are mindful of him? Who is this man? Who do you think this man is? Uh, you don't have to answer out loud, of course, but uh, think about it. Who is this man? What is man that you are mindful of him, that you care, that you made him for a little while lower than the angels? Who is this man? Uh, always in a church setting, if you're not sure, the right answer is Jesus. Uh, but do you think David, in writing Psalm 8, had Jesus in mind? Do you think David, when he was writing Psalm 8, he was thinking Jesus and saying, what is man that you are mindful of him? That for a while, a little while, you made him lower than the angel. Was he thinking about Jesus? I'm not sure if David was directly thinking about Jesus. I'm not too sure, maybe. But the author of Hebrews does something really interesting with this passage. He doesn't apply it in the first instance to man in general. He applies it to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's directly thinking of Jesus. And when you read it, it reads very differently when you read it as referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. What is man? 
What is Jesus Christ? What is Jesus that you are mindful of him? And I want you to look at Psalm 8 or Hebrews chapter 2 verses 5 to 8 in that light. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with the glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. He has put all things under his subjection. He has put everything in subjection under his feet. God has put Christ in charge of everything. How? How did God put Christ in charge of everything? And how did God put everything under the subjection of Jesus Christ? How did he do it? Through, I'm going to throw a big word, incarnation. Do not take incarnation lightly because this is a central miracle asserted by Christians. They say that God became man. God became man. What does that mean? Christmas is so radical because it highlights the fact that only Christianity of all the religions of this world, says the divine creator of the world has become human and therefore is vulnerable. He has come down. And that's what this incarnation is all about. And that's what Christmas is all about. And it's kind of weird that I'm talking about incarnation, coming down to be with us in person when we have online worship going on and we let people worship through online, and it's kind of weird talking about incarnation and the importance of incarnation, where you can experience and learn about incarnation online, not in person. This is kind of weird, but it's very, very important to think about this. I'm going to read a part of the sermon by Augustine about this teaching of incarnation. It's always good to read some classic writing sometime. And it was really appreciated, Andrew, reading a part of prayer from this old Dutch uh, reading. This is uh, in third century, and this is a part of a sermon that he preached, and I'm going to read this. This is so beautiful, I thought I'll just read it to you. The word of the Father, by whom all time was created, was made flesh and was born in time for us. He, without those divine permission, no day completes its course, wished to have one day set aside for his human birth. In the bosom of his father, he existed before all the cycles of ages, born of an earthly mother. He entered upon the course of the years on this day. The maker of man became man that he, ruler of the stars that he nourished at his mother's breast, that he, the bread, might hunger that he, the fountain, might thirst, that he, the light, might sleep, that he, the way, might be wearied by the journey, that he, the truth, might be accused by false witnesses, that he, the judge of the living and the dead, might be brought to trial by a moral judge, that he, justice, might be condemned by the unjust, that he, discipline, might be scourged with whips, that he, the fountain, might be suspended upon a cross. The courage might be weakened. The healer might be wounded. The life might die. To endure these and similar indignities for us, to free us unworthy creatures, he who existed as the Son of God before all ages without a beginning, designed to become the Son of Man in these recent years. He did this although he who submitted to such great evil for the sake had done no evil. And although we, who are the recipients of such good at his hand, had done nothing to merit these benefits, begotten by the Father, he was not made by the Father. He was made man in the mother whom he himself had made, so that he might exist here for a while, sprung from her who could never and nowhere has existed except through his power. Isn't this amazing? 
Isn't this amazing? So based on this sermon and from what we see in the Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 to 8, I'm just going to make two points. I'll just say two things about incarnation. The humiliating incarnation and the glorious incarnation. Here in this passage, for the first time in the book of Hebrews, but not last, you're going to see a connection between suffering and glory. In God's economy, these two things cannot be separated. Suffering and glory. In God's economy, they always go together. And there's no suffering without glory and no glory without suffering. That's why his suffering was not meaningless, and that's why those who believe in Jesus Christ, our suffering is not meaningless. Your suffering is inseparably connected to your glory, the glory that you will have and you have. And we see this phrase in verse 9. And if you have your Bibles open, you can look at it or you can look at the screen. And it's always a good habit to have your own Bibles open while listening to sermons so, because we're going through these verses. But we see him for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. So that by the grace of God, he might taste Death for everyone. By the way, chapter 2, verse 9 of Hebrews is the first time that the word Jesus is used in the book of Hebrews. And why the name Jesus? Because to highlight his humanity, especially the humiliation of Christ. The humiliation of Jesus that resulted in the glory. There is a connection between suffering and glory made here. And you can't have glory without suffering. You can't have suffering without glory. The glory of suffering and the suffering that leads to glory are both spoken in this passage. Because of the suffering of death, Jesus was crowned with glory and honor. You see, his suffering was not just a pathway to the glory. It's not just, all right, when I'm suffering, Jesus is not saying, when I'm suffering, I'll just endure it so that as long as I pass this, I can get to glory. That's not what Jesus is thinking. That's not what we see here in glory and suffering, humiliation and exaltation dynamic in the Bible. You see, It's not just a pathway to glory. Suffering in itself is a glory of God. And that's the path that God has chosen for his son, Jesus, and for his people, whom Christ calls brothers and sisters. You see, his humanity is inseparably bonded to our humanity, and that's why we share this common destiny with him, because he died on our behalf, because we have believed on him and his death, the glory that he experienced is our glory. That everything that Christ experienced is ours. And there's inseparable connection between not only glory and suffering of Jesus, but glory and suffering of ours and Christ. There's this mysterious connection there. And this is the hope of believers that our destiny is tied. That when there's suffering, there's always glory. It will never end with suffering. There's glory. And that's what we see in glory's incarnation. That's my second point. We're already in my second point. But I have three points on the second point. So don't get too excited too soon. We jump right into verses 16 to 17. Verses 16 to 17, this is a very, very important verse. If you can look at it, let's help our folks to read verse 16 and 17 here. For surely it is not angels that he helps, 
but he helps the offspring of Abraham. That's people. Therefore, particularly God's people. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. We're taught here not only that he was born to live a sinless life and die the perfect death, but he was born to be our representative. He was born to mediate on our behalf. And you can see verse 17. There are three things that we can see. Why was he born? Why incarnation? Why? For what purpose? First, in the first half of verse 17, we're told that he became man in order that he might be a merciful high priest. That's what the verse says, right? Become him, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. What's being stressed here is that there's necessary for him to be fully human in order to be representative before God. What did the high priest do? High priest represented people to God. High priest prayed on behalf of the people. The high priest offered up sacrifices on behalf of the people. And in order for the Lord Jesus to represent us as a merciful and faithful high priest, he had to be made like us. He had to take on humanity so that he can represent us, he can represent you, so that he can come to you and say, look, I want to bring you and I want to take you to this glorious God, our Redeemer, our King. He had to be. And that's what we celebrate on Christmas. He's my representative. How? He's my high priest. Faithful, merciful high priest. The second, notice, in second half of verse 17, we're told that he also had to be made human in order to make atonement for our sins, in order to make propitiation for the people. Propitiation. One of my favorite words. If I was a Baptist, I'd be like, repeat after me, propitiation, but I'm not a Baptist. I'm not going to do that. Propitiation for the people. He had to make like us. What does propitiation mean? That propiti propitiation means that all the righteous wrath and the judgment of God against sinners has been completely satisfied. Propitiation is different from atonement. It's not just removing sins. Now that, I'm going to throw you another big word I just remember. Expiation. That's the word that says, that's the word that describes or explains uh, Jesus' act of removing our sins. You see, Jesus, when he died on the cross, he didn't just forgive our sins. That's correct. But there's another side, and that is propitiation, where God's justice God's demand were completely satisfied. His judgment against sinners and Christ took on the punishment of God because of sin. Sin is terrible, you see. Terrible. Sin ruins our lives. Terrible. Sin had to be punished. Sin had to be taken care of. And Christ took upon that on himself and he was made propitiation. That Christ is a public, Christ's death is a public display of God saying, okay, this terrible sin that destroys my people. Someone's taking responsibility. And that's God himself coming in the person of Jesus. He came 
and he had to come. And he had to be like us to take the sins of this world. Though he knew no sin, he became sin so that he could be punished on our behalf. That's humanity. That's representative. That's Christmas story. And again, the third reason. See, I'm done. But I have three points under this third reason. Third point two. Third reason for the incarnation. Verse 18, we're told that Jesus was born to help his brothers and sisters. Verse 18, right? Let's read verse 18 again. Put my MOL people to work. Uh, for because he himself was suffered when he tempt, when, when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. He was tempted just like us in order to help us. The suffering of Jesus Christ under the power of temptation was real. Do you think Jesus was somehow supernaturally insulated from the temptations? Do you think Jesus had some way of excusing himself and insulating himself from all the suffering of temptation in this world? No. He had to be made like us. He was born as an infant. The writer affirms that Christ had suffered the heavy weight of temptation. Later, the author of Hebrews says in verse 415 that he has been tempted in all things and yet without sin. Jesus Christ remains ready and able to come to our aid in the moment of temptation. In the moment of temptation, when you're tempted, he's there. And he's like, I got you. I'm with you. I'm standing there. I've been a pastor for more than 30 years. And it's so happy, I'm so happy to see like people like Sharon here. I've known Sharon here in, in this church besides... Uh, well, probably I've seen Sharon, uh, Sharon Kim. Is she's uh, she was one of our leaders at church. Sharon Kim, I, I I've known her since she was like seventh grade or something. That's like, you're how old now? I'm gonna tell. No, no, no. <laughs> All right, I'm not gonna say it. Uh, uh, when I was 25, going to pastoral ministry, I think I was her. Uh, Sunday school teacher, and later became her youth pastor. I was Sue Min and Rosie's youth pastor in 1991. I moved to New York. 1991. That's a long time ago. I preached many sermons, led thousands of Bible studies. But I am pretty sure they don't remember what I preached. I'm pretty sure. There are many of you who heard my sermons for more than 10 years, and you know how I preach, what I preach, or do you? But there are many of you who've heard me for te over 10 years, and every time a guest speaker comes and speaks about something profound, uh, you act like it's the first time you've ever heard it. <laughs> I'm not bitter, by the way. Uh, I think there's a season and time for, you know, for you to hear. And uh, I, I often say this, you know, like, oh, this is so great. Oh, the speaker that you brought, da, da, da. And I tell uh, Candace going home, I said, I preached on this about three years ago. They don't remember. But I'm not bitter. You don't remember everything I said. Because that's okay and that's natural. Because I don't even remember what I preached. But that's okay. But I hope 
you remember me as someone who's there for you. That I don't know what he's said, but I remember when there were these times, he was there. And that's my hope as a pastor. And I think about that. You see, in this passage, what is emphasized here is that Jesus did not come just as a teacher. He came as your brother, as it says in verse 11. He came as your brother. He's not embarrassed about you as your brother. He's not embarrassed like some of you brothers are about your brother. He's not embarrassed. He is with you as your proud brother. If you feel the pull of this world, then I want to encourage and I want to exhort you to look to Jesus. Ask for his help. Recognize that he is a compassionate brother. And he is so ready to give you gracious help. And nothing can be more practical than this. And it would never happen if it had not been made like his brothers in every aspect. In every aspect, he was made like us. Again, what is Christmas? Christmas is saying something no other religion wants to say. No other religion dares to say the God who created the universe has become, as an infant, vulnerable. So that he can be our brother. He came into the suffering world and experienced suffering. He was tempted. Hunger, loneliness, homelessness, grief, rejection, betrayal, torture, injustice, condemnation. He experienced it all. Have you been betrayed? So has he. Are you broke? So was he. Are you lonely? So was he. Are you facing death? So he did. And that's why you can go to him. He's a wonderful counselor. And you need to trust him. You need to go to him with what you have. If somebody says, and you might, and I understand this, Sure, sure. I've gone to him when I was in trouble. I went to God. I prayed. I poured my heart out. And he didn't listen to my prayer. I feel like he's abandoned me. The preacher said, if I pray, God will answer. And I prayed. I prayed. But he didn't answer me. And I feel abandoned. Do you know what Christmas is? Christmas is saying God became man and experienced everything we experience. God knows what it means to be abandoned by God. So was Jesus abandoned by his Father. And he comes right to you and says, I understand. It's not just understanding and empathizing as powerful as it is, and we need that. He came to rescue us. When you say, if God is really committed to my glory, how in the world can he let me suffer and let my loved ones suffer? Don't you see that Jesus' glory was enhanced by suffering. There is no glory without suffering. There is no exaltation without humiliation. 
That's why God did not just stay in the heavens and say, chop, chop, this is how it's going to happen. No. On that Christmas morning, he came, became man, and became vulnerable. There's nothing more beautiful. There's nothing more powerful than the one who gave up his beauty and power so that you could have beauty and power. The ultimate strength the one who is strong enough to be weak and vulnerable and stand by your side and say, I'm here to be a representative. I'm your high priest. I was made of propitiation. And I'm your brother. He's so proud of you as you come to him. The greatest glory would be the person who gave up his glory so we could have God. You see, when you experience hardship, suffering, and I don't want to say this lightly, and uh, I've had share of mine in my ears and recent ears as well, And not to make light of it or not to just theologize it. When you suffer, when you experience difficulties and challenges in life and you look to him, you realize that you're walking the same path of Jesus. A path into maturity. A path into greatness. A path into wisdom. A path into sympathy for others and path into communion with God. You're so closely connected to Christ in your suffering. And when you're so closely connected to Christ in your suffering, you're so naturally connected to others who are suffering. That when you look to Christ and His suffering, and He will direct your eyes from yourself and look to others and say, hey, there are others who are suffering as well. And I can be an agent of God. Somehow, I can be like a high priest to others. Somehow, I can be somebody's brother or sister. When you're so connected to Christ, through suffering. And it's through our suffering and difficulties and challenges and confusions in life that you experience the closeness of God because our God is a God of suffering. And that's not the end of the story, is it? Because suffering will lead to glory. So with this Emmanuel presence of God, I want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters, to be a brother, to be a sister to somebody. There's somebody. If you can only lift your eyes and look to others, And how do you do it? When you look to Christ. And when we are connected to His suffering, He'll take us to others. And I hope we can go with this Christmas message.